I know that I've said this before at Mises Institute gatherings, especially ones held here, but I always think it's worthwhile to recall that I think were Mises to be alive today or would he, were he to be aware of this, that he'd be very pleased, maybe even surprised, that 50 years now since his death, that people were still studying his work, that they were interested in, in what he had to say, and more importantly, that there was an entirely scholar, there was a scholarly organization named after him at a southern college in the United States. I think he'd be uh, very surprised by that. He'd probably be pleased if he knew that we had established a purely Austrian graduate program here at the organization named after him. If you look at Guido Halsman's great biography, Mises, The Last Night of Liberalism, you will read that he endeavored throughout his career at different points and at different places to set up what he called a, a liberal institution to teach real economics and the scholarship of liberalism as it was known in his day. So I do think he would be pleased uh, looking down today to know that. So that said, we're going to have our processional. So if you'll please stay seated during that. Uh, and Clay, if you would cue the music, please. This is the second commencement we've had here at the Mises Institute. Our graduate degree in our master's in Austrian economics is now about three years old. And to present the commencement address for our graduation here, spring 2023, is Timothy Terrell, professor at Wofford College, one of the leading lights in teaching our Austrian graduate program. So please welcome Professor Terrell. I am honored to be invited to give the Ralph Rako Memorial Commencement Lecture at the second Mises Master's Program Commencement. I attend a graduate school across the street at Auburn University, but the Mises Institute has been a lifelong intellectual home for me, and it's gratifying to me to see that through this master's program, students are getting a high quality education in the same intellectual community that was life changing for me. I want to talk about intellectual community here briefly, but I want to start by saying a few words about a philosophy of education that is responsible in no small part for the substantial human freedom and quality of life that we enjoy today. It is a philosophy that Mises grew up with and which serves as a context for the Mises Institute's master's program. I refer to the liberal arts. In the United States, the liberal arts are commonly associated with higher education, though in Europe, the tradition is housed in the high school level gymnasium. At the liberal arts undergraduate institution where I have taught for over 20 years, Wofford College, I remind my students that liberal is derived from the Latin root liber, meaning free, and that the liberal arts are the arts of living as a free person. A person who has been well educated in the liberal arts masters the tools of independent learning based on the medieval trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. As Jeffrey Herbener explained it in a talk given here at the Mises Institute many years ago, quote, at the earliest ages, the student of the trivium would begin by memorizing facts. Having come to know the facts of reality, the student would conduct logical inquiries from these facts to organize and explain them. Having come to understand reality, the student would learn the art of communicating 
his understanding to others and persuading them of the veracity of his findings, end quote. Included in this would be the readings of the classics of Greek and Roman thought in the original languages. In medieval Europe, the student would then go on to the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Much of this structure was still a part of education in Vienna at the end of the 19th century when young Ludwig von Mises was in school. His reading of ancient Greek philosophy suggested to him that the, quote, the essential tenor of Greek ideology was the pursuit of liberty, end quote. And many years later in the anti-capitalistic mentality, he wrote that, quote, it was the classical studies, the essential feature of a liberal education that kept awake the spirit of freedom in the England of the Stuarts, in the France of the Bourbons, and in Italy, subject to the despotism of a galaxy of princes." End quote. The replacement of liberal arts education with vocational or technical training, even in institutions that refer to themselves as liberal arts, has accompanied the takeover of economics by philosophically vacuous technocratic mathematicians. The invasion of scientism is marked by emphasis on the mastery of theorems and statistical procedures in economics programs. It has made refugees of axiomatic deductive economists. This is not to say that quantitative skills are useless in economics, but Austrian economics rejects positivistic reductionism, that our knowledge is limited to what can be suggested through empirical methods. In the hands of the extreme positivists, economics has no axiomatic core, but is subject to being overturned by the next study. Mises Graduate School represents an effort to reverse that unfortunate trend. The students here are not separated from ultimate philosophical foundations. They are urged to think logically from the axiom of human action and build on its implications. Building economics from the ground up as this program does, economic concepts become a matter of logical deduction rather than an empirical suggestion. The incentives to follow the crowd in economics are strong. The malleability of mainstream economics has translated into job security for economists. Economists get cushy jobs as advisors and apologists for the state and as experts in creating technical arguments for employing state power on behalf of interest groups. Our graduate today, Daniel Tiche, said it very well when describing the difference between the Austrian economist Murray Rothbard and the mainstream Paul Samuelson. Quote, the economy can only be understood as a constellation of individual actions. It makes no sense when one focuses on aggregates. The focus on the national level also has clear political applications and overtones which the Austrian tradition recognizes as part of the problem. Real economics is not an arm of the government, it is a science. Truth content gives way to policy cranks when there is a focus on controlling the economy rather than describing its workings." End quote. So the mainstream has traded Mises for Polonius, a more scientifically minded Polonius perhaps, but a Polonius nonetheless. In human action, Mises described this sort of economist Quote, by virtue of their connection with definite parties and pressure groups eager to acquire special privileges, they become one-sided. They shut their eyes to the remoter consequences of the policies they are advocating. With them, nothing counts but the short-run concerns of the group they are serving. The ultimate aim of their efforts is to make their clients prosper at the expense of other people's. They are intent upon convincing themselves that the fate of mankind coincides with the short-run interests of their group. They try to sell this idea to the public." End quote. Mainstream economics, enticed by taxpayer dollars and seduced by mathematical sophistication, has thus become a vocational pursuit, a set of tools best suited to policy tinkering or formulaic business forecasting. The Cambridge economist Alfred Marshall wrote an influential textbook that is in many ways a forerunner of today's mainstream economics textbook. He was a mathematician before he became an economist and used mathematics extensively in economics, but even he recognized that mathematics had its limits. In 1906, he wrote to a friend, 
Arthur Boley. Quote, I had a growing feeling in the later years of my work that a good mathematical theorem dealing with economics hypotheses was very unlikely to be good economics. And I went more and more on the rules. One, use mathematics as a shorthand language rather than as an engine of inquiry. Number two, keep to them till you have done. Number three, translate into English. Four, then illustrate by examples that are important in real life. Number five, burn the mathematics. <laughs> Number six, if you can't succeed in four, that was the illustrating in examples that are important in real life, burn three. That was the <laughs> translation into English. This last I did often. Austrian economists would say that Marshall nevertheless committed some serious methodological errors. Among these was his belief that the methods of the natural sciences could be applied to economics. And today Marshall's hesitancy to use mathematics as an engine of inquiry has been forgotten among mainstream economists. In our zeal for formalism, we have lost the importance of philosophical thinking about the discipline. This is reflected in the decline of courses in the history of economic thought in most economics programs. I am happy to say that the Mises Institute program includes two history of economic thought courses. We think about schools of thought sometimes associating ideas with an individual, Aristotelian, Marxist, Marshallian, Kosian, Rothbardian, because there is a human intellectual entrepreneurship that is inseparable from the intellectual pathways that our minds follow. Here let me emphasize the humanity of that intellectual pursuit. In recent months, new developments in natural language artificial intelligence, such as ChatGPT, have sparked conversations about how higher education might be affected. Machines are not capable of behaving entrepreneurially, though our use of machines can influence our thinking. For example, they can be used in spreading ideas, allowing us to more easily discover connections, granting easier access to many types of data, or adversely, destroying our focus. I'm sure we will continue to develop what is called artificial intelligence, but I've not been impressed with the quality of its judgment. I experimented with ChatGPT, including an assignment in a class this January where I asked students to ask ChatGPT a question and then critique its answer. It showed that it often provides an inoffensive and superficial distillation of what people have already said or thought, a relentless averaging of whatever is available on the internet. I asked ChatGPT what it would say to graduating students. Here's what it said. <laughs> Congratulations, you've made it to this milestone in your life and you should be incredibly proud of all you've accomplished thus far. Take a moment to reflect on the journey that brought you here today. Remember the challenges you faced, the lessons you've learned and the people who have supported you along the way. Graduating from college is just the beginning of your journey. You have a bright future ahead of you, full of possibilities and opportunities. Embrace the unknown, take risks, and never stop learning. As you move forward, always remember to stay true to yourself and to, and to your values. Success is not just about what you achieve, but also about how you achieve it. Be kind, compassionate, and always act with integrity. Finally, I want to leave you with a quote from the late Steve Jobs. <laughs> Your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. So find what you love, pursue it with passion and dedication and make the most of every opportunity that comes your way. Congratulations and good luck. <laughs> this insipid mediocrity might be reduced with more specific directions to the AI, but a philosophically profound exhortation this is not. I understand that a few days ago a new version of ChatGPT arrived, which is apparently able to pass exams in law with something like a 90% success rate, describe images accurately, explain what is humorous about an image, and write tens of thousands of words of coherent text that can pass for human. In this, it has matched the abilities of many of my undergraduate students. <laughs> my friend Jonathan Newman 
who teaches economics at Bryan College in Dayton, Tennessee, recently asked ChatGPT how ChatGPT could be used in the classroom. ChatGPT replied that it didn't know what ChatGPT was. <laughs> how can you not know, said Jonathan, you are ChatGPT. ChatGPT replied with an apology for not having information from the last two years or so in its database. <laughs> I suppose we can take some reassurance from the fact that ChatGPT is not self-aware. <laughs> in this lack of self-awareness, ChatGPT has matched the abilities of many of my undergraduate students. <laughs> ChatGPT said that was supposed to be humorous. An optimistic take on the development of AI is that it will handle some routine tasks for academics, helping us focus on what is real intellectual entrepreneurship or the more philosophical aspects of our discipline. The teaching part of our jobs may change for the better. Not easier, but better. As Peter Jacobson pointed out recently, AI may force professors to reemphasize live human interaction in classes and in-class testing, since it will be relatively easy for students to hand off discussion posts and short reading summaries to AI. That means that professors will have to really teach. Instead of mindlessly assigning busy work from publisher quiz or homework apps, professors will have to become effective in the classroom and be accessible to students. This brings me back to the importance of human personal relationships in education. A good institution of higher education is one of intellectual community. It is a place where one can devote hours to focused and directed study of an idea as opposed to the pseudo-intellectual dilettantism that infests society. And it is a place where there is freedom to utter a poorly formed or unpopular idea with the expectation that others will assist in developing the best of our thoughts and sloughing off our blunders. This is where institutions offering small classes in the liberal, uh, liberal arts tradition can flourish. And I've watched these intellectual communities develop in the master's program here. The students in this graduate school are enthusiastic about learning and are establishing lifelong connections in a small group of similarly motivated scholars. They are avid readers and are willi willing to dig deeply into a text and ask hard questions. I think about the Mises Fellows who have gone through the Mises Institute for many years now. I came to Auburn University for my PhD work largely because the Mises Institute was located here in Auburn. Here I met other students going through the graduate program and a lasting intellectual community was formed, which became a community more deeply as many of us became lifelong friends. But informal associations not structured as schools or research institutions can also foster intellectual community. If I could offer an exhortation to our graduate today, and I'll add our past graduates, it is that they use their education to contribute to their own intellectual communities in the spirit of the liberal arts. In this, we can take some inspiration from the scholar after whom this lecture is named, Ralph Rako. Rako attended Mises' graduate seminar at NYU where he met Murray Rothbard. Subsequently, Rako, Rothbard, George Raisman, Ronald Hamowy, and others created the Circle Bastiat, an intellectual community that developed ideas on liberty and economics at a time when the Austrian school was much smaller and less influential than today. Several of these, after honing their ideas in the Circle Bastiat, went on to hold academic positions where they could pass on what they had learned to younger scholars. Rako received his PhD from the University of Chicago, studying under Friedrich Hayek in 1962, having learned German on Mises' advice. He translated Mises' liberalism from German into English. He taught at Wabash College, where, which is a liberal arts college in Indiana, and then Buffalo State College. We have the advantage today of cheap global communication so that unlike the Circle Bastiat, the intellectual communities for the graduates of this program can be more, easy, more easily be international. Mises Institute master's programs, our master's program students are all over the planet. After going through a rigorous program together, I'm sure that some of the connections made here will last for many years. 
Your own intellectual communities need not be a gateway to academic work, though of course we certainly could use more academic economists in the Austrian tradition. Indeed, Austrian economists have often found success without the advantage of a prestigious university position. Mises had an impact that defied his academic circumstances. He never had a paid academic post in Austria, but was undeterred. And after fleeing the Nazis to the United States and arriving in New York in 1940, Mises was still unable to find a permanent position in academia. New York University only hired him in 1945 as a visiting professor with his salary paid by free market foundations and businessmen. He had only a few students who obtained doctoral degrees and academic positions, though some of these had outsized influence. Universities generally shunned him, but the power of his writing and the enduring appeal of his ideas has made him an icon. The English economist Alfred Marshall had an influential post at Cambridge University and therefore had the opportunity to teach students who would eventually promote his ideas themselves in academic positions. His 1890 book, Principles of Economics, ran to nine editions and was the standard economic textbook in Britain for 30 years. Yet I would guess that Mises' name is more widely known today than Marshall's, though Marshall's economic ideas, unfortunately, are more prominent in mainstream textbooks. We might say the same about Murray Rothbard, uh, uh, the same as we said about Mises, who spent about 20 years teaching part-time at an engineering institution that had no economics department. I learned yesterday, by the way, of the selfless devotion to his students that Rothbard displayed when he was at UNLV with regular meetings off, student, uh, off campus with students. At a restaurant, he and Hans Hoppe created an intellectual community that most of us would give our right arms to have been a part of. What might have happened if Mises had secured an academic post that was more conducive to producing graduate students? What would have happened if Rothbard, instead of having what Hans Hermann Hoppe described as a fringe existence in academia, had taught a, at a prestigious institution? We don't know, but the immense value of their contributions is clear. The intellectual communities they have created have had a lasting impact. They did not give in to evils, but proceeded ever more boldly against them. Many academic institutions are more focused on protecting their authority than identifying and promoting the best scholarship. We are starting to see end runs around those institutions. It's interesting to speculate on the possible paths forward in higher education, which might reduce the ossification so common in academia. Maybe if state-funded institutions were bypassed by a new generation of institutions that are more streamlined, efficient, and independent of government money, students will be less susceptible to economic theories that serve as justifications for state intervention. I think the Mises Institute's graduate school is part of that new generation. For K through 12, I'm encouraged by the growth of homeschooling and alternatives like the Thales Academy. Outside of academia, there's also a desperate need for economically literate non-academics to promote sound economic thinking in business and in law and in the rest of society. In my area, in the Carolinas, several dozen people who support the Mises Institute have organized and are meeting several times a year to get to know one another socially and to hear some informal talks. I was talking last night with Grove City College students who started a human action reading group apart from their classes. These individuals are taking it upon themselves to be educated and to push back against economic mediocrity. The people in this room today believe in the power of ideas and in virtue. We have an intellectual community that is developing individuals capable of sound economic reasoning when much of society is busy abandoning it. This community is not generating insipid mediocrity that could be mistaken for the output of an AI algorithm. I'm confident that it is going to have a larger and larger impact on the world. And seeing the quality of the students coming out of this graduate school, we have good reasons to have hope for the future. Our graduate today is someone you should meet, and you will be as encouraged as I am. Those who are currently enrolled should be commended for taking on such a rigorous program. What this program is accomplishing is vital to our civilization. It is the alternative to social decline. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'd like to next introduce Joe Salerno, Academic Vice President of the Mises Graduate Program. Thank you, Joe. Thank you and welcome on behalf of the faculty of the Mises Graduate School. Joining me on stage are Joseph Becker, Provost of the Mises Graduate School, Peter Klein, the Carl Menger Research Fellow, Mark Thornton, the Peterson Luddy Chair of Austrian Economics, and Paul Swick, Professor of Economics. I would like now to address our degree candidate. Upon recommendation of the faculty of the Mises Graduate School, and by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Directors of the Mises Graduate School, I hereby confer upon you the Master of Arts degree in Austrian Economics with all the rights, responsibilities, privileges, and immunities appertaining thereunto here and elsewhere. Congratulations, you have graduated and are now officially a Mises graduate alumnus. Um, let me now read your name and thesis title and then come forward. Daniel Touche, thesis title, The Pure Time Preference Theory of Interest Explained and Critiqued. Thank you for attending. Congratulations to Mr. Tichet. And please stay seated for the recessional, and then we will have a reception outside next door in the library. Thank you very much. Thank you.